You're listening to The Jacob Volk Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Volk. Here he is. Jacob Ball. Of the Jacob Volk Show, I am Jacob Volk, and I have to start by breaking down the idiot that is Jared Porter. More specifically, the human piece of garbage that is Jared Porter. For those unaware, he was fired just over a month into his tenure as Mets general manager because of lewd text messages that he sent a female reporter. He did this while he worked for the Chicago Cubs in 2016. The texts were highly explicit, incredibly inappropriate, and even culminated with an erect, fully exposed penis. If you want the full details, you can read the ESPN article that Mina Kimes and Jeff Passan wrote. But I will warn you, it's not exactly the easiest thing to read. Let me start by saying that the Mets obviously did the right thing in firing Porter. They had absolutely no choice. Porter admitted that this was him. There should be zero tolerance for this type of conduct. The Mets did the right thing. Is it a bad look that this is the second straight year they've had to fire someone in a high-ranking position just weeks into the job? Yes. Obviously, last year they fired Carlos Beltran and now Jared Porter. Is it the Mets' fault? No, it's not their fault, But it's not a good look for the organization. The Mets handled this the right way. Almost immediately after this article was published, Steve Cohen went on Twitter and announced that Porter was fired. That is the right thing to do. There's no question about that. But... The simple fact is, this is the second guy that this has happened to. First Beltran, now Porter. These guys don't even get a game in their new positions before you're forced to fire them. It's not the Mets' fault, but it's not a good look that they can't get these hires right. Now, let me just say that I'm not the right person to further break this story down. I'm a man. My perspective on this isn't as good as a woman's perspective. She can speak to 
how widespread instances of sexism are. I mean, this is beyond sexism. This is sexual harassment. There's no question about that. And Jared Porter should never work in baseball again. In fact, he should never be hired to even flip burgers at your local fast food restaurant. His conduct was so unacceptable, it defies logic how he could think it's okay to act the way he acted. But again, as a man, I don't have as good a perspective on this as a woman does. Maggie Gray on Moose and Maggie Today did an excellent job breaking this down. Let me tell you, Moose and Maggie is the best show on WFAN. It's not even close. Now, at the beginning of the show, she outlined three questions that have been widely asked in the aftermath of this story. Why didn't she immediately tell him to stop? Why is this coming to light now? And did the Mets know or should they have known about his conduct? The first question is just straight victim blaming. It is a ridiculous mindset. It is not the woman's responsibility to tell a man to stop. The man should know that what he's doing is wrong. You're sending this woman tens of lewd text messages. You're not getting a single response. Take the freaking hint. She's not interested. More to the point, You're trying to take advantage of someone who's new in the country, doesn't know the language very well, doesn't know this country's customs very well, and you're really taking advantage of her. Shame on you, you disgusting excuse for a human being. This woman was so traumatized by what happened that she left baseball altogether, returned to her home country. We don't know where she's from. We don't know who she is. And now she works in finance. So way to go, Porter. You just ruined this woman's dreams of working in baseball. All this woman wanted to do was cultivate a professional relationship so she could do her job. It is the job of a reporter to foster relationships between players, coaches, and front office members. That's all she wanted to do. And you decided to seize on that vulnerability by sending her pictures of a nether region. You're telling me it's the woman's responsibility to say stop? In that case, no. Not even close. That is victim blaming to the nth degree. The woman did nothing wrong. All she did was try to do her job. And she was rewarded for it with graphic texts from a vile human being. 
The second question, why is this coming to light now, is a good question. But it's a question that only ESPN can answer. They've been sitting on this story since December of 2017. They waited over three years to publish this story. In that time span, you have no idea if Porter did this to another woman. If he did, you can hold ESPN responsible for not exposing this man for what he truly is. ESPN will tell you, oh, we wanted to keep it quiet until the woman was ready to speak out. We didn't want to put her in an uncomfortable situation like Porter did. That doesn't work for me. That is not a valid reason to not publish this sooner. If in 2018, 2019, or 2020, he did this to other women, I'd hold ESPN responsible. The reality is this article could have been made ready to be published in 2018. I understand wanting to sit on it until you get both sides of the story. But then when you get Porter's side, publish it. Now ESPN didn't get his side of the story until recently. But there's no excuse for that. Again, if in 2018, 2019, or 2020, Jared Porter did these things to other women, I'd hold ESPN partially responsible. Because if they had released this story sooner, Porter never would have been in that position. No one knew that this was a thing. This is a guy who is very well respected all throughout baseball. He was a finalist for the Angels GM job. He takes the Mets job partially because he wants to learn from Sandy Alderson and in due time, he'll get to run the Mets. And he'll get to do that with an owner who's willing to spend money. What's better than that? This guy was in one of the most enviable positions in all of sports. A Major League Baseball general manager. And he deserved it. Again, very well respected guy. Paid his dues. Worked his way up the ladder. No one had any idea that this guy was really a monster. I don't care if you did this once or you did this a hundred times. You're a terrible human being. Look, I understand wanting to protect the original woman that this happened to. If she really feared reprisals in her home country, okay. I get that. I empathize with that. But what about protecting all the other women that Porter came in contact with in 2018, 2019, and 2020? At this very moment, and this may age horribly, or it may age like a fine wine, but at this very moment, This is the only woman that we know of that Jared Porter did this to. If she is truly the only woman, then ESPN got really, really lucky. If she's not, if Porter did this to other women, 
if I was those women, I'd file a lawsuit against DSPN. You knew about this, and you did nothing about it? You saw this guy get promotion after promotion after promotion? You let this guy be Mitch GM for over a month? And then you finally decided to publish the story? That is a terrible job by ESPN. And again, if I was those women, I'd file a lawsuit. There may not be other women. But we don't know if there are. We don't know if there aren't. ESPN had the ability to take down a monster. And they didn't. Think about it this way. If you're Sandy Alderson or Steve Cohen, whoever made the final decision to hire Porter, you put all the females surrounding the Mets, whether they work for the Mets or they're on the Mets beat, in danger. Again, not Alderson's fault, not Cohen's fault. There is no way on this earth that they should have known about this. But boy, I'll tell you, if I was in charge of the Mets and I hired someone who endangered the safety of all the women who work for me and cover the team, I'd feel really bad about that. It's nothing against Alderson. It's nothing against Cohen. They are innocent bystanders in this. But they did accidentally endanger the welfare of all the women surrounding the team. ESPN really endangered them. Let's fast forward 12 months from now. Let's say Porter is still GM of the Mets. And let's say he harassed a woman with the Mets. This article comes out. The woman that he harassed with the Mets comes out and says, Hey, this happened to me. The Mets are in a terrible spot. Alderson's in a bad spot. Cohen's in a bad spot. It's not their fault. ESPN hung them out to dry. And these aren't allegations or anything. Porter did this. He came out and admitted it. I understand wanting to wait until you verify a story like this. But again... It was very easy for ESPN to reach out to Jared Porter. They could have done it sooner. They chose not to. That is a terrible job by ESPN. They should be absolutely ashamed of themselves. Because they endangered... All the organizations that Porter worked for. They endangered the people that hired Porter. And most importantly, they endangered the females within that organization. And the females that covered the organization. I'm stunned that ESPN isn't getting more heat for this. Jared Porter is getting a lot of the heat, and he deserves it. He's the one who did all this. But ESPN stood by and kept him in a position of power for over three years when they had the ability to stop him. And again, they could have verified the story very easily. Porter's the big bad wolf here, but ESPN 
is in second place in that regard. Moving on now to a much better Mets story. The story that the Mets wanted to be discussed. The Joe Musgrove trade. The Pirates sent Musgrove to the Padres for five players. Hudson Head, Omar Cruz, David Bednar, Drake Fellows, and Joey Lucchesi. Lucchesi was then flipped to the Mets for Andy Rodriguez. I'll start with the Padres. Is there a team in baseball history that has made more of a concerted effort to improve than the Padres. A.J. Preller had one of the best farm systems in all of baseball. But he recognized that prospects are pieces of paper. So he decided to trade some of them. Not all of them. The Padres still have a great farm system. They still have Mackenzie Gore. They still have C.J. Abrams. They still have Luis Camposano. They still have Robert Hassel. They still have Ryan Weathers. Their farm system is stacked. And again, you've got to give A.J. Preller a ton of credit for realizing that he had the flexibility to make all these trades. Bringing in Clevenger at the deadline, bringing in Darvish, bringing in Snell, bringing in Musgrove. I understand that Clevenger isn't going to pitch this year. But think about this rotation. Blake Snell, you Darvish, Chris Paddock, Joe Musgrove, and either Denilson Lamet, Adrian Morahone, or Gore. That's one of the best rotations in baseball. It may be the best rotation in baseball. And that lineup is going to be able to score. Hosmer, Kim, Tatis, Machado, Grisham, Myers. You've got to tip your cap to A.J. Preller here. He doesn't care that the Dodgers are in the same division as him. He doesn't care that the Braves are still good, that the Mets got a lot better. This guy is making a serious run at a World Series. The Padres are legitimate World Series contenders. Do I think they'll get there? No, but you can make the argument that they could. And in the offseason... That's really all you can ask a GM to do. You can't say enough good things about A.J. Preller. Having said that, though, I'm not crazy about this trade for the Padres. It makes them better now. There's no question. And that's what Preller wants. He's damning the torpedoes and going full speed ahead while keeping his fantastic prospects. There's no question about that. I don't begrudge Preller for that. This trade does make sense. But the simple fact is the Padres 
did overpay for Musgrove. Now, I like Musgrove. I think he's a solid four starter. On some teams, he could be the third starter. But in a perfect world, he's a four starter. He's never finished with a winning record. The best ERA he's had was last year. It was 386. Before that, his best ERA was 406. He's a streaky pitcher. One year he's good. One year he's not as good. One year he's good. One year he's not as good. Last year he was good. If the trend continues, he's not going to be as good for the Padres. Is he a good pitcher? Yes. He has the stuff necessary to put it all together and have consistently good seasons. This guy has talent. There's no question about that. There were rumors earlier in the offseason that the Yankees were interested in him. He would have made sense for the Yankees. But as for what they gave up to get him, the Pirates had to be really happy with their return. Hudson Head can play all three outfield positions. Fantastic speed, really good arm, good glove. He's crazy athletic. Very high ceiling guy. The thing is, he's not as good with his bat as I'd like him to be. Some scouts are higher on his bat than I am. There's no question that Head has the ability to really improve his bat. He's very strong, great bat speed, and he's very smart. He'll be a good contact hitter. It's possible he could turn into a decent power hitter, but I don't think anyone will be mistaking him for Adrian Gonzalez anytime soon. But he does have the ability to be a Steve Finley type. I like this kid. He has the potential to be really good. I just think his floor is that of a backup outfielder. That's lower than some people think his floor is. Omar Cruz has sky-high potential. He throws three pitches, fastball, changeup, curveball, controls them all really well. I want his velocity to be better. He's lucky to hit 95 on his fastball, but as he gets older, he should be able to add a little more power behind his pitches. He's going to turn 22 next week. I'm not kidding. In seven days, he's going to turn 22. So the Padres gave him a nice early birthday gift. I think Cruz can turn into a really good starter in this league. If nothing else, he's a reliever who's just going to locate his pitches really well. I'm higher on Cruz than most. David Bednar has seen limited Major League action. He pitched 17 games for the Padres in his career. Hasn't been particularly good. Went 0-2 with a 6-7-5 ERA. It's now or never for him. He's with a team in the Pirates that desperately needs relievers. They have a few solid relievers. 
Richard Rodriguez, Chris Stratton, and Jeff Hartlieb. But no one's going to be mistaking any of those guys for Kent Tacovi anytime soon. Bednar has a real chance now to carve out a legitimate role for himself in the majors. The Pirates are going to give him every opportunity to prove that he can stick in their bullpen. He has a really, really good fastball, gets a lot of movement on it. He has a splitter with late movement. If he can figure out his curveball, sometimes he has a tendency to hang his curveball. That's when he gets burned. If he can control that better, the Pirates got a good future reliever. There's no question about that. Drake Fellows, I'll be honest with you, I don't know too much about him. I know he went to Vanderbilt, my father's alma mater, so I know my dad will be rooting for him a lot, but I just don't know too much about him. His college stats weren't that impressive. I like that he went 13-2 in 2019, but a 409 ERA, that's not great. Does Fellows have some potential? I guess the answer is yes. But the thing that's really going to hurt him is he's going to turn 23 on March 6th and he hasn't pitched in professional baseball yet. He's either going to prove that he can hang with the big boys or... He's going to struggle to make an impact. There's no in-between. And Andy Rodriguez, the guy who the Mets flipped for Joey Lucchesi, has a ton of potential. This guy has the tools necessary to stick at catcher. It's very rare that you can find a 20-year-old switch-hitting catcher with the athleticism and arm necessary to stick there. More often than not, those guys need to move to first base or the outfield. This guy can stick at catcher. He's a switch hitter who always finds a way to make contact with the baseball. Not a lot of power, but that's okay. Catchers aren't bred for power. He's just a natural hitter. Very, very fun player to watch. Has a lot of the tools you look for as a catching prospect. I'm higher on this kid than most. It does make sense for the Mets to trade him for Joey Lucchesi. The Mets were concerned about their rotation depth. Yes, they have DeGrom. Yes, they have Carrasco. But Marcus Stroman sat out last year. David Peterson only has nine starts to his name in the majors. And Steven Matz was god-awful. The Mets did need to improve their rotation depth. They needed a guy who could be a long reliever and start in a pinch form. That's Lucchesi. In 2019, Lucchesi went 10-10 with a 4-1-80 RA. That's Fine. I remember really liking this kid coming up through the Padres system. It makes perfect sense for the Mets to go after him. All in all, there are no true losers in this trade. 
The Padres could regret this trade in the future, but as of right now, it makes sense for him. That's all Preller cares about. He's looking to make a legitimate run at a World Series. Musgrove will help the Padres do that a lot more now than guys like Head, Cruz, Bednar, Fellows, and Lucchesi would have. Having said that, though, in the future, guys like Head, Cruz, and Bednar could turn into solid contributors for the Pirates. And they could have an impact more than Musgrove. So because of that, the Padres do get my lowest grade. I'll put the Pirates as the winner because they got some really, really good prospects. But the Mets aren't too far behind them. They added really good rotation depth and gave up a guy who's still a few years away from contributing in the majors. The trade made a ton of sense for them. It made sense for all teams. It's just some teams won it more than other teams. Moving on now to the Nationals, signing John Lester to a one-year deal worth $5 million. And this makes sense for the Nationals. I understand you look at his stats from last year, and you see a guy who went 3-3 three and three with a 5-1-6 ERA. Yeah. He was bad last year. There's no question. But, again, 60-game farce. I'm not going to look past John Lester's track record because of what he did in a season where he had no proper spring training and only 12 starts. The year before, he went 13-10, and with a 4.46 ERA. He also led the National League in hits given up. Not a good year. I understand that. But there's no question that Lester has the ability to bounce back. There was a time when he was one of the best pitchers in baseball. In 2018, he was an all-star. He led the National League in wins with 18. The Nationals did need to shore up the back end of their rotation outside of Scherzer, Strasburg, and Corbin. They really didn't have anyone who they could count on too much. Eric Fetty is solid, but he's certainly not the pitcher that everyone thought he was coming out of UNLV. Five mil a year is a fair price for a bounce-back candidate in Leicester. He makes perfect sense for them as a fourth starter, a second lefty to pitch behind Corbin... The move makes a ton of sense for the Nationals. Moving on now to the Blue Jays, signing Tyler Chatwood to a one-year deal worth $3 million. And this makes sense for the Blue Jays. They did need some rotation help, there's no question. Besides Hyunjin Ryu, there's no one in that rotation I trust. Taiwan Walker looked really good for the Blue Jays, but he's got to do that again before I can really believe in him. 
He finally stayed healthy. That's the key for him. Walker has talent. He's just never been able to stay healthy. Robbie Ray didn't have the impact that the Blue Jays wanted. Tanner Roark didn't have the impact that the Blue Jays wanted. The Blue Jays are desperate for rotation help. And Chatwood makes sense as a guy who could maybe fill a role in their rotation. I'm not crazy about Chatwood. I never thought he had a lot of talent, to tell you the truth. Is it possible he could turn into a fifth starter for the Blue Jays? I guess. But instead of the Blue Jays focusing so much on guys like Kirby Yates and George Springer and Francisco Lindor, I'd rather they focus on a guy like Trevor Bauer. They desperately need rotation help. Their lineup is incredibly talented. Vlad Guerrero Jr., Kevin Biggio, Bo Bichette, Lourdes Gurriel, Randall Grichuk, Teoscar Hernandez, Rowdy Telez. Focus on the rotation. The Blue Jays want to make a splash. They couldn't do much better than signing Trevor Bauer. And Bauer would probably want to go to the Blue Jays since he'd get to pitch against Garrett Cole a lot. Those two guys don't like each other. All right, now I'll give you some NFL vault talk. And the Baltimore Ravens cut a couple vested veterans. Mark Ingram and RG3. The reality is it makes sense for them to get rid of them both. Ingram was expendable with Gus Edwards and J.K. Dobbins in the fold. Ingram was due $5 million next year. That's not going to work for a third-string running back. You knew the Ravens were going to get rid of him. They had no spot for him. In fact, they made him inactive in their two playoff games. Ingram still has talent. He averaged over four yards a carry this year, but he had a career low in rushes, career low in rushing yards, career low in attempts per game. The Ravens had to get rid of him, but I do think Ingram will land on his feet. I have no problem with him being some team's backup running back. As for RG3, that was expected too. The one game that he started against the Steelers, he was dreadful. Completed just 7 of his 12 passes for 33 yards. He was sacked 3 times, turned the ball over twice... Was good with his legs. whoop de do. You know what? If you get pulled for Trace McSorley, you don't have a place in this league going forward. Also, Tyler Huntley, in filling in for Lamar Jackson on Saturday, didn't look bad. He's a younger and much better version of RG3. It wouldn't surprise me if Huntley was the Ravens' backup. That leaves no room for RG3. Good decision to get rid of him. I'd be surprised if another team gave him a chance. I'll close this show out with a really sad death in the NFL world. 
a death that was announced yesterday, but actually happened on Saturday, and that is Jaguar John Arnett dying at the age of 85 from heart failure. From the mid-50s to the early 60s, there were very few running backs as dominant as Arnett. And it's a shame because very few people remember him. I understand that he played from 1957 to 1966 in the NFL, but you know the name Gale Sayers. You know the name Jim Brown. You know the name Paul Horning. You probably don't know the name John Arnett. In Arnett's first year playing for USC in 1954, he helped lead the Trojans to a Rose Bowl appearance, but they lost to OSU 20-7. to Every year that Arnett was at USC, he had over 600 rushing yards. Now that may not sound impressive now, but it was good enough for him to win the W.J. Voigt Memorial Trophy in 54 and 55. That award was given to the most outstanding football player on the Pacific Coast. Arnett was insanely dominant, incredibly efficient. It helped lead him to being the second overall pick in the 1957 NFL Draft. One pick behind Paul Horning. The Rams were probably happy with how it turned out with Arnett, as in his first five years... In the NFL, he made the Pro Bowl. The guy could do everything. Run the ball. Catch the ball out of the backfield. Return kicks. Return punts. He was insanely versatile. In 1958, he made his only All-Pro team. You can certainly make the argument that he should have made more. It's a shame that he never made the playoffs. He just had the misfortune of playing for some bad Rams teams and a few bad Bears teams. He was elected to the College Football Hall of Fame in 2001. An incredibly well-deserved honor. Like I said, Jaguar John was incredibly dominant from the mid-50s to the early 60s. May he rest in peace. Until tomorrow, I am Jacob Volk saying, Old Timers games, weekends, and airplane landings are alike. If you can walk away from them, they're successful.